Hi, it's Peter from The Mentors and welcome to the mini course about the modular monolith. Now, before we begin and before we later on jump into the code, I just wanted to let you know that even though the code is written and the overall solution is actually written in c and .NET as a platform, you should still be able to follow uh, the idea and the patterns behind the modular monolith regardless of the technology and the framework that you are working with, whether this is Java, PHP, Node, Go, Rust or any other language that you are familiar with, you should hopefully still be able to follow these patterns because modular monolith is not about the you know, programming language, it's more about some set of patterns and you know this a little bit different kind of architectural style that you can apply into your maybe next solution. But be before we move into the actual code and before we start talking about you know samples in code and how the things are all tied together and what is the vertical slice and what is the module, how it's implemented and whatnot, let's now discuss what the actual modular monolith is and how you could compare, for example, modular monolith to the, let's say, classical monolithic approach or to the microservices. Okay, so most likely you are familiar with the classical monolithic architecture. And by classical monolithic architecture, what I have in mind is this, you know, layered, horizontally layered kind of architectural style where you have a set of layers, for example, let's say presentation layer, and then you might have some kind of application services layer, and then maybe data access layer, and then maybe your domain models layer, right? Whatever set of layers that you can think of, whether this would be three layers, four layers, five layers, some kind of N layer architecture, right? And this is like the classical approach. And I'm not saying this is, let's say, a bad approach or the best approach, there are always trade-offs to one or in the other, another approach. But uh, the core idea behind this classical monolithic approach is that you have established pretty much just once your archi architecture and you just have to stick with it. And the issue that might come once you start building your monolithic app and maybe there is, let's say, 10 developers or even more developers working on this app and this project has been going on for months or maybe even for years now, there is more and more code being added into this monolithic architecture, um, what might happen is that, well, sooner or later, you probably find out that depending on the you know domain that you are working with, whether this is going, be, going to be some kind of e-commerce, financial, insurance, or any other kind of domain that you can think of, it's you know very possible that this particular domain has you know different complexity in you know different parts right so what does it imply is that within your monolith most likely you will find some let's say parts of your domain that you know might be or you know might might have a good fit for this particular architecture let's say you went with three layers presentation layer, data access layer, and maybe some application slash domain logic layer. And maybe this is good for dealing with a little bit sof more sophisticated CRUD operations or stuff like that. But maybe it's not sufficient to deal with some, uh, you know, complex um, routing algorithms or complex financial operations or some complex policies, right? M maybe for this particular piece of your domain, you would rather stick or you would rather choose a different kind of you know architecture maybe you would go with four layers or five layers maybe you would think of you know putting in place some kind of domain driven design tactical patterns right maybe you would went with cqrs common handlers or maybe with even driven approach or anything else but since you have established your arch architectural style you know somewhere uh, at, at the very beginning of your project, you just have to deal with it. And if you have to go through the controller, map your request to some you know, request object, and then map it to DTO, and then map it to entity object, and then vice versa, to map it away you know, behind from your, let's say, domain services, application services, and to your presentation, and to your controllers, and then back to the color of your API, you just have to pretty much deal with it, right? So you might quickly realize that 
this particular architecture that you thought might be a good thing, good fit for any use case is not really the best fit. For some use cases, it might be a good fit, but not for all of them. And this is actually, you know, one of the main reasons um, behind modular or behind the classical monolith being not the best style, not the best, you know, uh, idea for most of the projects out there. Because if you are working, let's say, on a rather small project, and maybe there is just a few developers in the team, or you know the domain that you are working with very well, maybe you're also some kind of a domain expert, and you know what will be, what pieces of code will be put into your solution, there is a high chance that maybe actually this three, four, or five layered horizontal architecture will be a good fit, and it will it will be a good fit for all the use cases, all of your subdomains that you have to deal with for as long as you have to work and maintain this specific project. But once you are, let's say, not a domain expert, once you are working with more complex domain, once there is more developers coming to the project, well, this might actually turn out to be this so-called big ball of mud at some point where you just have lots of people that have to you know work with once established architecture a long long time ago and they will start doing some dirty workarounds and some dirty hacks because for their specific use cases for their maybe less or more complex problems depending on the architecture that you decided to go with at the very beginning of a project They'll be, you know, they'll think something like, okay, I don't need this, so I'll just try to go directly from this layer to this layer. Or maybe they'll think something like something otherwise. So I wish I had one more layer. So I'll just put there, put these additional abstractions there. And there is like a high chance that, you know, multiple workarounds or hacks will start appearing within your solution. Or maybe there'll be lack of time to write a proper test or things like that, most likely they will probably happen sooner or later, right? So once again, to sum it up, it's not that the monolithic architecture is bad because it's fine. The ease of use, you know, the ease of working with the code, the ease of deployment, it's all great, right? And most of the developers out there, they are pretty much very familiar with this style. This is usually probably the first architectural style that... Um, they ever work with during their first jobs. But again, once you, you know, start working with some more complex domain, and once you have to deal with more complex code, you might realize that maybe there is some other way. Maybe there's something better. Maybe there is some way to actually split your horizontal approach, as which you know has been established for all of your use cases within this specific solution that you are working on and maybe there is some way to actually split it from this horizontal approach to more vertical oriented approach in which you could decide what kind of architecture or what kind of specific layers could be actually designed could be actually added you know to work around to help resolve this you know, less or more complex problems for this specific part of your domain. Before we move on into the modular monolith specific details, let's see how we could divide our systems by distribution or by modularity. So by distribution, we mean how much the system could be distributed into set of standalone independent applications that could correlate with each other, work with each other, talk to each other in order to move on with this overall distributed system uh, changes in let's say this distributed machine state. So whether we can have set of independent applications that would work with each other in order to move on with next steps that we want to or, or process that we want to run within our system. And by modularity, what we mean is whether we can have a set of independent autonomous either modules, as you will see later on, 
or applications that, as I already mentioned, are independent from each other, meaning that ideally they have very clearly defined boundaries. So, for example, you could think of having, let's say, application application A, B, C, and D, and from the application A perspective, it doesn't really matter whether the application B or C or D is reachable, whether this application is live. If we have good boundaries and if this application is truly autonomous, it should be able to operate on its own, right? Without being dependent, without being coupled with other apps. And if you think about a kind of, let's say, architecture, kind of a system, which is both distributed and very modular, right? Very autonomous, this would be microservices. And of course, very well written microservices, which unfortunately is not always the case, right? So quite often people, developers, sometimes the managers, they decide to move on into this microservices approach, which is great, which gives you lots of benefits, starting from the, for example, organizational ones. Like you can clearly define which particular developer or which team is now responsible for this specific repository in which this you know, particular microservice will be built, maintained, tested, deployed, and so on and so on. And then this specific team could, for example, decide, all right, they want to go with this technology, this framework, this architecture. They want to have fully, auto fully automated CICD. So maybe per each commit, they want to build, test, and deploy this new microservice version into this uh, sandbox or test or later on maybe production environment. And then you can hear about such a great benefits, like for example, asymmetric scaling, meaning that you, know, you can horizontally scale by adding more instances to your microservices, just like you could scale the monolith behind the load balancer, but with microservices, you could decide, all right, so I want to scale this product service to maybe 10 instances or this order service to 10 instances, but I don't want to scale the shopping cart to 10 instances, right? Because I don't need to. So you can pick which particular service you want to scale out horizontally, asymmetrically, independent from the other services. So there is lots of benefits when it comes to the microservices, but also there is lots of drawbacks, right? Once you move into the microservices, you have to deal with all the networking challenges, right? So you could, for example, maybe you have read about the fallacies of distributed computing um, invented or written by originally by the Sun engineers. So there was original seven uh, principles or fallacies, and then there was eight fallacy added in 19th, so almost 30 years ago. And you know you could never uh, you can never really rely on the network. You can never take that there will be let's say uh, no latencies that the network will be secure that the bandwidth will be infinite and so on and so on. So there's like lots of challenges, mostly related to the infrastructure, to the network, to to the management, monitoring all the DevOps stuff stuff when it comes to the microservices. And unfortunately, because people are either Maybe they are working with microservices for the first time, so they don't really have a good framework in place to you know, build their services. Or maybe um, they have a good framework, they know how to write a clean code, a very nice optimized code, but they don't have a good DevOps, so they don't know how to orchestrate, how to, how to deploy, how to monitor, trace, and do a lot of other DevOps monitoring related stuff when it comes to managing your distributed microservices system, right? Or even worse, maybe they got it all right. They are good developers. They have a very strong DevOps background as well, but they didn't really spend much time or maybe they didn't really, really spend the time at all to clearly define the boundaries of their services, right? So maybe they you know, weren't aware or just didn't want to use techniques like, let's say, event storming or some other sort of so soft techniques when it comes to modeling, when it comes to defining our system boundaries, our services boundaries, uh, 
coming, for example, from the strategical part of domain-driven design. So if you will get your boundaries wrong and you decide to move into the microservices, what you will mostly, most likely end up with will be this very bad thing, this kind of an epic failure called distributed monolith, right? So still, you will have some kind of distributed system, right? Because it's not a big deal to write a bunch of different apps you know, deploy them to different servers or even put them into containers, run them Kubernetes or OpenShift or anything else, anywhere in the cloud or bare metal, whenever you want to. But it doesn't make your overall system modular. You just distribute your system, but in order to make it modular, and for example, in order to achieve this perfect microservices, you need to have a proper boundaries of your apps. Because if you don't have the proper boundaries, most likely what is going to happen is you will see your services talking synchronously to each other, right? Service A talking to B and then B to C and then maybe C to A and A to D and so on and so on. And you will start observing this spaghetti code, this dependencies, this tight coupling between your services synchronously talking to each other through HTTP, WebSockets, gRPC, whatever protocol you can think of. As long as it's synchronous and as and as long as, for example, these services are being very chatty and, you know, each one service talks to another and another one to talks to another one. And, for example, if one of the service fails, now there might be, let's say, five services, depending on the specific service, because they need to pull the data from the service very often. Well, unfortunately, this is a very bad sign of, you know, having not really the proper microservices, but the distributed monolith instead, right? So if you want to have a proper microservices, ideally you should try to avoid having this so-called dependencies to avoid having this also so-called temporal coupling between your services. And usually this is achieved by moving more into event-driven approach where you start cutting off any uh, synchronous communication between the services and start moving into this event-driven approach where you simply just um, start sending the events between the different services. But it's not an easy task. And, you know, in some domains, it's not always possible, maybe in, let's say, medical domains or financial domains, there may be scenarios in which you would rather have your system fail, right? then you know deal with some kind of eventual consistency when it comes maybe to your payment processing or your medical treatment processing right just just think of you know for example rendering some kind of uh, graphical interface for the patient in a hospital where data is eventually consistent and then maybe the doctor comes and because the data you know wasn't hasn't been synchronized yet and you know the doctor can see that, for example, this specific medicine has been had been given to this patient a few minutes ago. This patient will get another you know dose, another portion of this medicine, and very bad thing may happen. So there might be the cases, there might be you know kind of specific domains in which this even driven approach will not always be possible, right? And it's still fine as long as you are aware that, for example, this is your core service, and if this service goes down, then maybe some other parts of your system will go down, right? So there is nothing wrong about it. But uh, still, if you will, if you are not going to spend any time in one of the techniques that I mentioned, like event storming or any other technique that you can uh, find out when it comes to you know, defining the boundaries of your apps, it will probably turn out sooner or later that bad things will start happening with your system, all right? You will start seeing your services talking to each other very often, being very chatty, and then eventually, one by one, they might start falling apart. So this is what you want to um, avoid, right? And this is why I would consider not really jumping into the microservices, even if you are already familiar with them, because even if you have worked with them for maybe many years now, you are probably you know, aware what's the, how big the operational cost is, 
how how much does it cost to set up the whole infrastructure to maybe teach the other developers right how they should work with microservices how these services are being are, are going to be deployed what libraries they should use to allow the devops for monitoring tracing to make their life easier when it comes to deployment and testing and even then right it's really difficult to start from let's say very first day or very first sprint to start delivering the business features so there might be a chance that at some point you might need the microservices but maybe um, you feel like it's not the best idea to, to start with them immediately or maybe well you're just a bit afraid um, that you know these microservices they sound really cool but you have never worked with them but still at some point in the future you might consider transitioning into them but on the other hand you don't want to you know start building next monolith right because you know this horizontal architecture approach and you know that transitioning from this classical monolith from this classical horizontal architecture into microservices might be difficult because there will be some coupling between your components this specific part of your domain might not be very well defined might not have a clear boundaries so extracting you know specific parts of your classical horizontal layer monolith into microservices might be a bit of a difficult task and this is where our modular monolith and the idea behind having a single unit of deployment like in monolith but being modular like in microservices comes into play so now let's talk about the modular monolith all right so the modular monolith as already mentioned is still going to be kind of a monolithic application right meaning that we'll have a single unit of deployment we'll have we'll have a single artifact just like in a classical monolithic app but the core difference between the classical monolith and the modular monolith is that you will start thinking now in terms of so-called vertical slices so you will avoid having a single let's say established once and for all so i'll put this put it this way established once and for all architecture which would be split horizontally let's say into this classy classical presentation data access layer and some application logic layers let's say you will no longer have this horizontal architecture split into n layers but instead you will have this set of vertical slices and within each vertical slice being your module you can apply any kind of architectural style as you can think of so this is why i you know put this emphasis on having this very well defined clear set of boundaries when it comes to your modules and whether this would be your modules or microservices maybe later later on this is what you should really do at the very beginning before you start coding anything and again this is not part of this course right how to define these boundaries how to for example uh, conduct the event storming session or how to make use of some strategic parts techniques from for example domain driven design that could help you with finding these boundaries we'll probably cover these topics also in one of the future courses but for now let's just assume that you know using one or other technique we have managed to define this clear set of boundaries and again this is why the modular monolith might be a good choice or maybe even a better choice at the very beginning of your next project even though if you are thinking about transitioning into microservices later on because if you are if you are to start work on a very new domain and there might be a lot of hidden parts of this domain it's much easier to refactor to change the code to even let's say rethink your boundaries and maybe merge one model with another one if it would turn out after some time that actually 
these two boundaries that your domain expert thought might be distinct modules are pretty much are should for example belong to the same module this is much easier achievable than if you were to start with microservices and then start merging your distributed apps your separate repositories into let's say single project so this is just easier to work with especially if the domain is rather unclear and you expect it to be a complex stuff so this is what our vertical slices are going to be all about, right? This will be our modules. And within those modules, we can put any kind of architectural style as you wish, right? Anything. If you want to have this module, you know, based on, for example, two layers, go for it. If you want to apply some domain driven design here or CQRS or even sourcing, maybe for this specific module, you need these patterns, right? You need these techniques go for it you are not restricted in any way you are not depending on any other module right there is let's say no coupling between the modules at all ideally right so that let's say the module a shouldn't really you know talk to module b what should be the architecture of the module b right this should be two totally autonomous pieces within your solution and once again this is why having this clear set of boundaries is uh, such an important thing, right? To avoid any possible dependencies, uh, any possible copying, coupling between your modules. Because keep in mind, and I already mentioned this a few times, but I really want to emphasize it once again. Some parts of your domain might be very simple to work with. For example, let's say you are going to work with some basic forms where you just want to edit your customer or your user data. You can think of, you know, having, for example, some kind of user interface from a web or mobile application that would talk to your API and then just a bunch of forms that would accept some parameters like first name, last name, address, identity type, and so on and so on. And you would simply just save into database, make an update into database, call it delete on your database, on your tables, and that's it. So a simple set of CRUD operations. And now the question is, if you were to go with classical, you know, classical horizontally split architecture in this classical monolithic approach, and if you were to start with, let's say, four layers, and you would establish this as your base architecture, you would have to go through all these layers only to achieve a simple CRUD. While on the other hand, if you were to, let's say, establish for your next classical monolithic project, two layers or maybe three, three layers. And then you would find out that maybe you start working on some complex part of your domain. Let's say something related to uh, making managing your customers, but in terms of, let's say, discounting them or calculating the optimal route for your parcel delivery within your logistics system. Now you have to work with two layers or three layers, right? Or maybe, and maybe with just simple controller view model that doesn't, that doesn't really seem like a good fit, good fit for your much more complex subdomain, okay? But with the modular monolith, it's really up to you what kind of architectural style you want to apply within each module. And this is why with modular monolith, we talk about this vertical slices. We think about our solution in a vertical way where we define what is the architecture for which module, depending on its use cases, depending on its complexity, depending on whether this is a simple CRUD, whether it needs domain-driven design, even sourcing, even driven architecture, common queries, all these different things. If you need it, just put it in your module. If you don't need it, just go with something simpler. Right, and you are not restricted to doing pretty much anything. So this is really a nice part. So from that point on, you might start seeing some similarities to the microservices. Of course, most likely you aren't going to write your uh, modular monolith in five different languages, like you could, for example, do with microservices, because the microservices what you typically care about is, you know, being able, for example, to expose some kind of web API or being able to connect to some kind of message broker to integrate through the events and maybe a few other things. 
but usually, typically these are probably the core requirements when it comes to choosing the technology. Of course, regardless of having the team of developers that know this particular language or framework pretty well. But with modular monolith, well, quite obviously, you typically probably stick to the single language within the whole solution. But uh, that's, I think, kind of natural. And then within the solution, it's really up to you how you want to split your architecture between different modules. Just like in microservices, it's really up to you how you want to build your microservices in what kind of architectural style. So same here in a modular model approach. So we talk about vertical slices from now on. Now, what is the next important stuff? So of course, there are a few very strict rules that you have to stick to in order to avoid the coupling, right? And in order to actually achieve this, let's say pure and true modular monolith so I will call it this way. So what are these things? Well, let's assume that you have your module's boundaries defined well. You have a clear set of boundaries. Now, in order to avoid coupling, what you really need to do is to encapsulate all your data and all your application business logic within your module. So whenever you think of, let's say, module A communica communicating with module B, Let's assume that you have maybe some e-commerce system. And then you have, for example, orders module, users module, deliveries module, payments module, and a few other modules. All right. And let's say that our orders module needs some data from the users or customers module. So in a, let's say, classical monolithic app, what you would probably do, maybe you would just inject some I customer repository into your order service or order manager component and you would just grab from this customer's table the specific customer's data and maybe put some parts of the data into your order details right let's say order customer well this is not how we are doing things in, in modular monolith if you have different modules they have to encapsulate it, their data meaning that when it comes to let's say one module accessing data from other module, it can never never go directly into this specific module database. And again, similar like in microservices. If you have microservices, you don't really want to integrate through a single shared database. Now, I'm not saying that within modular monolith, you need to have different database, let's say cluster per different module. What I'm saying is that still, you might have a single database and share them across different modules, but you need some kind of separation between your databases, right? In order to be able to encaps encapsulate, let's say these databases. So for example, if you are to use um, classical SQL database, MS SQL Server, uh, MySQL, PostgreSQL, well, one of the best ideas in order to achieve this logical separation between your databases and between the tables that might be used between different modules by different modules would be, for example, by using schemas. So imagine you have a single database, but each module have each module will have its own schema, all right? And when, let's say, orders module wants to grab some data from customers module or users module, this is this module will not make use of the connection string of this module, and you know talk to, you know, fetch the data from this module schema, from the database, but instead it will directly call this module API. So just like, again, in microservices, if you want to get some data from another service, you would, for example, send some kind of HTTP request as long as this specific microservice does expose some kind of public web API. And maybe within this a API, you would find something like, get customer by ID. You would send a request to the specific microservice, for example, for HTTP, WebSocket, gRPC, or any other protocol for synchronous communication that you can think of. You would receive the data and then move on with your internal processes. So in modular monolith, it's the same. If you want to get some data from other module, you need to see if this specific module actually exposes some kind of public API. And since we are going to work in a single solution, in let's say single code base in terms of language, and we could reference one project from another. So there are like few ways to achieve it, achieve it 
and probably the most common way, I'm not saying the best way, because there is like there is like there's like best way to achieve this or that. There are always trade-offs. So what I'm going to show later on once we'll jump to the code is I think this very common approach in which you have some sort of additional shared kind of project, some kind of shared common project, which can be exposed by any of the modules within your app. And if you want to get some data, if you want to get some, you know, details, or maybe later on messages, events, comments, queries, whatever you can think of from other module, you would just reference this specific shared slash common project that belongs to this module. And then within this project, you, you could define some kind of module API client, right? As an abstraction, for example, as an interface in C Sharp or Java that you could later on inject again through, for example, IOC container using some dependency injection techniques into your application services or controllers or anywhere where you want to inject this specific abstraction. And then you would call, for example, from the ordered module perspective, something like customers module client dot get customer by ID, All right? And you would call this specific module API. So there is no networking. You are working with, an, let's say the same process and you are just calling your methods, you know, that live somewhere within the memory of the same machine. So this is much easier when it comes to actually dealing with this because there is like no networking, no latencies a bit, you know, uh, within. So this is very nice. But again, this is a very crucial part. You never want to go directly to the other databases, to the other data storages of different modules. You only need to, you only can communicate with different modules through their public APIs, just like in microservices. Because once you start, once you break this rule, what, what is going to happen is that the people, the developers, the team working on this different module that you are now, you know, getting data from, but in this dirty, hacky way by, you know, using their connection strings, what, what is happening now is because this team is fully responsible for managing, building, testing this module. So once this team starts changing their database because they have full right to do it, right? This is their module. Like, just like it's their microservice, is their module. They can do whatever they want with their database. But if you, you know, instead of calling their module client, the module public API, you will start fetching data from their schemas, from their tables, and they will change it, well, you'll be very angry, right? Why, why did they change this customer's table, right? They had no right to do it. Well, they had full right to do it because you should never talk directly to their database. Instead, you can only use their public APIs to get data from them or to send some maybe comments to them, create customer, ban customer, start payment. If it's not defined within the public API of a specific module, it means you can't do it from your other module perspective. So you can either ask the team to provide you this method within their module, or, well, you have to maybe redefine uh, the boundaries of your uh, module. Jokes aside, right? This is, but this is the reality, right? I would say the probably most important role, role. encapsulate the data within the scope of a single module, and then public, expose the public API and only talk through this API. And I would say start with, uh, let's say, single database, let's say single cluster of PostgreSQL server or MongoDB, whatever. Start using your, for example, schemas or different collection names to achieve this logical separation of data between the modules. But again, if you decide that maybe for this module, you want to set up Cosmos DB or I don't know, Neo4j or whatever you want, that might be the best fit for your module and the part of the domain that it's dealing with, you are good to go. It's really up to you. It's your decision because the other modules, they can only talk for your public API. So they should never really care what is the underlying data storage for your specific module. So data encapsulation, exposing the public API and the public API going on and the communication going only for the public API are crucial to avoid the coupling between your modules. And pretty much the one last thing, and I also mentioned this when I quickly discussed the microservices, 
So in order to achieve even better decoupling between your modules, right? Because when you think about one module calling another module, you can see that there is some kind of coupling involved. Because let's say module, let's say orders module, has to be aware about the customer's module and has to inject, for example, this customer's module API, just like from the microservices perspective, the orders microservice would have to synchronously call the customer's microservice, for example, through HTTP request, which actually um, what's happening when you are calling one method within memory or when you are making the synchronous request, there is this thing called temporal coupling happening where your module or microservice is now coupled for this specific time, for the specific interval, let's say few seconds or half a second with this module or microservice because it has to synchronously await for the response coming from this module or microservice. You can also think of reducing this kind of temporal coupling by moving more into event-driven approach. And we'll discuss later on, especially when we jump into the code, you will see uh, how we can achieve this event-driven approach and when it's the best fit. But with the event-driven approach in mind, what I'm saying is maybe instead of you know calling directly one module, right? Let's say by instead of calling directly uh, module A from module B or module B from module C and so on and so on, Maybe instead you could have your modules, you know, publish some kind of events. For example, customer created, order paid, delivery started, invoice returned, and so on and so on. And then the other modules would just simply subscribe to such events. And then based on these events, these modules could, for example, save some data into the databases, start some processes, remove something, update some data, whatever you can think of. All right. So instead of relying on this synchronous communication, whether this is modular, monolith, or microservices, well, maybe it will be a better idea, as we'll see later on if it's a better idea or not, to move more into this event-driven approach, where we just push some messages to this so-called message broker component, some kind of infrastructure component that is responsible for accepting the messages and then sending them further to the interested modules or microservices, and this is how we can achieve decoupling, right, between our modules or microservices. So even, let's say, from the microservice perspective, even if the microservice that we were previously depending on goes down, if we move towards this even driven approach, we can still, let's say, complete this payment because we have already saved this customer data into our own database. So for example, the customer's module or the customer's microservice it's still this so-called single source of truth when it comes to customer data, but since we only needed a subset of customer data, for example, the first name or our own address, we could just keep it in our local database for our own usage, and maybe we don't need to call this customer service every time for this synchronous HTTP GET or for the synchronous internal module-to-module -module calls to get this customer data, because we could subscribe to the events like customer created, customer updated, customer logged, customer others changed, and just update our so-called local cache, our local database, and just use the customer data that we have on our own within our own database. But again, uh, we'll see later on when we jump to the code how this can be achieved. So ideally, to sum it up, we want our modules to fully encapsulate data, to achieve this logical separation, at least by, for example, providing different schemas for our you know, uh, modules and their distinct tables. We want to communicate only for the public APIs. And ideally, we want to reduce, reduce this communication as much as possible and move more towards this event-driven approach. And one last thing, and again, very similar to the microservices. In modular monolith, you will quickly find out that there is many common shared parts. For example, logging, caching, authorization, authentication, um, message broker, some kind of event definition, message definition, commands, queries, database connections. So there is like a lot of parts that could be put 
into the, let's say, single project or multiple projects, some kind of shared, common, util kind of helper solution, and you would just reference them and use them across different modules. And this is totally fine. When you think about your infrastructure, like database connectors, message broker connectors, or any other cross-cutting concern, which is not an application or business logic, let's say authentication, authorization, logging, caching, all these sort of things, or some kind of abstractions, maybe for your events, comments, messaging, whatever you can think of, you really want to put this into this, uh, let's say, single solution, single project, or maybe split this into multiple projects so you can reuse it across different modules. And pretty much you would do the same for your microservices. You probably don't want to, even though you could, and some would argue that this is how you should do things, while I, I would say this isn't how you should do things. Um, so whenever you have any kind of infrastructural parts or to be more generic, to be more, let's say, universal, any kind of cross-cutting concerns, you just implement them once and you reuse them. Database, logging, decorators, caching, auth, all this stuff which is not any specific application or domain logic which belongs to the specific module keep could and should be kept within some kind of shared project that later on can be published as let's say set of NuGet packages or NPM packages on Maven or any other kind of you know build system and public repository that you are going to use to just share your packages across your uh, modular MOLIF or later on maybe across your microservices. So that's the core idea behind the modular MOLIF, the vertical slice, having this uh, autonomous modules with clearly defined boundaries and you know having this public API, this um, data encapsulation. And if you follow this rules, this let's say strict set of rules, you should be yeah, you should be good to go, I would say. So now before we jump into the code, let's just discuss what our sample project is going to be about. The application that we are going to work with is called NPay. You can think of some kind of extremely simplified version of applications, for example, like Revolut or N26, if you have ever used them which are kind of very cool fintech mobile banking apps in which you can quite easily set up your account and then extremely fast start sending or transferring your funds between the different wallets. So you could, for example, send your funds to your friend or maybe your father or your aunt or anyone else within a matter of seconds, right? So this is a very, very cool stuff. So uh, we are going to assume that we are already after some kind of, for example, event storming session, that we have already found the boundaries of our within our app, within our domain, and we have started uh, implementing our modules. And you will see that there will be just three modules for now. There will be a notifications module dealing with our notifications, email, text messages, or push notifications. There will be our users module dealing, for example, with our customers, users, registration, authentication, and so on. And there will be our wallets module dealing with our funds transferring across different modules. And of course, in a real world application, you would find many more modules or later on many more microservices, but still, the whole idea behind this course is not to implement like a real world production ready application, but to give you an idea to teach you about some of the patterns and principles, right? Uh, in the specific case related to working with the modular monolith architecture. So now let's finally jump into the code. Let's see how we can clone the solution and let's start running our very first use cases to see how our, our modules can communicate and integrate with each other. All right, let's start by cloning the app. So if you go into our dev mentors and then slash npay project, which is publicly available on our GitHub, you can simply take and clone this repository 
if you want to play with it. Currently, this is written in .NET 5.0. It might be upgraded into the upcoming .NET 6.0, which should be a seamless upgrade at some point in the future. So in order to run this, you only need this SDK and you also need to either pull and install Docker because we are going to use the database that is run as a Docker container or you could install this database on your own. So as you can see, I have already cloned the repository. So there is my repository visible here, already loaded as a solution into the JetBrains Raider, but you can use Visual Studio or VS Code, whatever you feel the most familiar with. And let me also jump into the file explorer view from the VS Code. So there is our, our file explorer view and just to make sure that we can build and start it up, let's start with a Docker. So you will find that there is this single Docker Compose YAML file here, which only uses the Postgres as an image. So we will have the Postgres SQL database, all right? So let's just run this Docker Compose. So I'm going to simply type Docker Compose up minus D within the root directory of our repository which should find this docker compose default file and start this container. So docker ps should give me now this Postgres up, you know, being full available up and running and exposing this public port so I can connect to this Postgres SQL database from my app. And I can now run the app. I can run the app through the command line or I can run the app through the IDE or from the VS code. So let's just try to build it from both the IDE and also let's try to build this through the CLI by typing .NET build. So let's see, there should be no errors. The green should be just fine. The build should be like fully green. Let's see. All right, so it's looking good. And finally, let's try to start the app just to make sure that everything is working and expected at and that we can actually see the database. So I'm just going to start the app and as you can see, the app will live under this bootstrapper project. We'll get into that very soon. So let's just run this only executable project, uh, which is available within the solution. This ASP.NET Core app being called .npay.bootstrapper. So let's run this and let's see what happens. So we should see now our app being exposed at port 5000. But when you start the app for the very first time, you will also see the logs there, meaning that our database now is being created, right? So let's now try to connect to our database. You can use any kind of PostgreSQL tool that you can think of, the Beaver, pgadmin, or DataGrip. I'm going to use the JetBrains DataGrip. So I have already connected to my PostgreSQL database by using the default properties. So localhost, default port 5432, and user Postgres default one without any password. So that password is empty. I'm just going to connect and let's refresh. And I should see now our NPay database, all right? And if I expand this NPay database, you should see now that here we have our two schemas, all right? So in total, you will have here three modules, notifications, users, and wallets. We'll get to this module soon, but because notifications doesn't need a database and we have database defined only for the users and wallets module, you can see that by following this logical separation based on schema, we have one database for our users with, for example, just a single table called users. And we have another database for our wallets module with three tables, at least for now, for this specific module. So we have already in place our logical separation when it comes to the data storage. So hopefully you should be able to start the application simply by running the Docker infrastructure with this single Docker Compose app command, which will run your database. You should be able to start the app either through the IDE, or if you want to run this through your terminal, simply go to the SRC, and then bootstrapper project and then type .NET run, which will you know, have the same effect, meaning it will start your app by, and it will expose your web server for the Kestrel. And you can of course navigate to this default localhost 5000 port and you should see this 
hello world message from your bootstrapper component which starts your whole app so once we have our app you know working and once we can access our app on this public port 5000 let's see how our modular monolith is built when we actually from the code perspective so now that we are certain that we can start the app that the database is up and running let's see uh, what our modules are all about and how all this stuff is tied together okay so if you expand this modules directory you will see here our free simple modules so the first one is notifications right notifications as the name states will be solely responsible for sending any kind of notification let's say to the customers of your system you can think of sending let's say for example the email notification uh, text message notification push notification right any kind of notification that you want to send to your users or customers for example customer verified uh, password reset completed, um, transfer received, um, deposit made, payment completed, right? So you would use this module, you would use this, for example, email sender to send these emails or maybe later on you would add there more components to, you know, also support text messages or push notifications or any and other kind of messaging when it comes to your system and human interaction, right? So this is our very single and ver sorry, very simple module, all fully related to dealing with the notifications. Now let's move on to the next module. As you can see, this module actually contains two layers and one additional layer. We'll talk about this one soon. So this module pretty much has all its logic within a single layer. The users module now contains two layers. So here you could find, for example, some kind of presentation layer. So you can expect that this module most likely will expose maybe some kind of web API, some kind of public API for the controllers or plain ASP.NET Core routing or any kind of routing mechanism that you can that you are using within your framework and within the language that you're working with. So here, for example, we have some kind of users controller with a set of HTTP methods for getting the data, for creating users, and so on and so on. And then we have additional layer. I just call this a core layer, but it's not really like a core layer. For example, from the clean architecture perspective or domain layer, it's just a layer in which in order to separate our presentation from anything which is data or application logic related, we just wanted to have this in a different layer. And here you also find that if you remember, we have distinct schemas between the users and wallets between these two modules. So for example, here I said that, all right, so within my data access layer directory within this, let's say subdirectory of this project, I want to specify that this module will, for example, contain this set of tables and I want to use this schema. And again, depending on the ORM or some lightweight library that you are using to talk to your database, you could achieve this in different ways. But this is, for example, if I were to use the most popular framework, ORM, for, uh, for .NET being anti-framework, and in this case, the anti-framework core, this is, for example, where I would specify that this is going to be my default schema. And of course, within this module, I could keep all my, for example, entity mapping configuration for this specific uh, type. So this is when it comes to data access layer. The most important part is this logical separation. Now, here you would find typical stuff as in, uh, you know, kind of CRUD application or, or kind of CRUD project. Uh, just a single entity, at least for now. As you can see, it's not the terrible entity. It could be worse. At least we have private setters. But really, besides the constructor and, you know, some public method there, not a lot of stuff is really going on here. So you would find here some entities, maybe, you know, some custom exceptions, if this is how you deal with the errors. I personally prefer throwing a custom exception instead of relying on some single exception and then public codes or exception codes or public exceptions from the system API. 
So for example, here I have a few custom exceptions defined within this module. What I can also find is of course our application services. So this is where I am going to define kind of mix of application slash domain logic, if I can actually speak of any sophisticated domain within this very simple module here. So typical stuff, some kind of I user service slash manager interface, which will eventually, eventually keep on growing. Uh, I will start adding more methods into this interface. Maybe later on, I'll decide to split this interface into two interfaces or, or not, or I'll just keep adding methods and keep adding more and more of lines of code here. Uh, but really like very typical stuff, you know, for example, I will directly make use of my database. Maybe I don't even care about the repository pattern at all here. Maybe it's not needed for me. So I would just inject my database context here and I will directly ask for my user when someone asks for the user uh, by the user ID. I can do the same for my, you know, uh, get user by email. When it comes to browsing the user, I could of course extend it with some additional paging and uh, sorting or filtering. When it comes to, let's say, creating the user, I would accept, maybe I you know, wouldn't go this far and uh, expose my user entity from my controller. Maybe I'll have at least this one more additional, uh, uh, let's say anti-corruption layer being the DTO object where I would define some kind of DTO representing my user. So this is what I am going to return or I'm going to accept when it comes to my presentation layer and then push it further to my uh, data access layer or to my actu actual only single uh, core layer. But there isn't going to be, I am actually going to use this DTO as both the input and output from my methods, right? So I'm not even bothering with stuff like CQRS, comments, queries, different read or write models. This is just a plain DTO. I'm just going to pass this DTO to my at user method. I'm going to perform here some very basic validation, maybe by, you know, some <laughs> ethology uh, in place, or maybe by injecting some validator here to run this validation. And finally, I'm just going to construct my user entity, save into database, verify the user, and so on and so on. And even though the mapping here is done as a set of private static method, but of course I could extract it and maybe make use of AutoMapper or Mapster or another mapping library or maybe my custom interface. So this is the kind of code that you have, might have seen multiple times. And honestly, there is nothing wrong with this kind of code, right? This module seems to be very simple. It seems to be more like a CRUD module. There isn't really going on, a lot of going on in terms of, let's say, business language, this uh, ubiquitous language from the DDD perspective, right? So there is just stuff like create the customer, update customer, edit customer. So why would I add more and more complicated stuff. Why I would try to maybe go with clean architecture in this place. Maybe I don't need this. Maybe this is just going to be a simple module and you know we want to keep things simple. So this is our users module. And now let's move on into our wallets module. So the wallets module, as you can see, is yet again, another module containing another you know set of layers. So here we had two layers and now we can see there are four layers. So I'm not going to get into the specific uh, what these layers are all about because Derek in his own course about the CQRS plus skin architecture that was, that's been recently published on our YouTube channel, he discussed this in depth. So you should be, if you haven't watched this course yet, I strongly recommend you do watch it. But if you have ever worked with the clean architecture on our architecture and CQRS in general, most likely you are familiar with a similar set of layers, right? So you'd have your core layer where your domain lives with nice encapsulation, ideally no reference to the other frameworks. And this layer would be like fully unaware of serialization, transportation layer, database, and so on. Then you have your application layer in which you can find some kind of comments or queries or events any kind of application logic which makes use of this core layer, building blocks, services, repositories, factories, policies, and so on, to orchestrate these use cases, right? Then we have some infrastructure layer, which might contain our data access layer. It might contain some caching, authorization, all this 
cross-cutting concern, and finally we have our API layer. Again, bunch of controllers or just plain routing and simply responsible for exposing our public API. So from our wallet module perspective, uh, what is important here is that, for example, you can find here a wallet aggregate, right? Once again, direct init course uh, talked about this uh, concept. So we have our wallet aggregate with some identifier, with some version. And of course, this version is going to be used as our concurrency check, right? From the database perspective. So for example, our wallet will be responsible for keeping track of all the transfers in or out transfers, or uh, to speak it, let's say, more, more in depth, uh, it will keep track of all the money that we are, received, we are receiving, that we have received, and all the money that we have sent to someone, so all the payments and all the, the deposits and all the withdrawals that we have made from our wallet perspective, and it will be, let's say, responsible for um, validating its invariance and just making sure that this, wa this wallet is always in a valid state, right? So this is the place where we would, for example, make use of the domain-driven design and some nice encapsulation and all its building blocks. So for example, if I want to transfer the money from one wallet to another, I would, for example, declare here some kind of method like transfer funds, accepting uh, the receiver, another wallet, and then I would call get funds from original wallet, add funds to the receiver wallet. I could, for example, publish some domain events internally. I could return the list of transfers. So as you can see, all this stuff is nicely encapsulated. I have some validation there in place. So I don't have to call additional validators on top of it because this aggregate should take care on its own, right? It should encapsulate and it should validate um, its own state every time whenever I'm trying to change something or create a new wallet. So this is going to be our wallets, wallets module. We have a few aggregates there. We have some value objects once again, um, encapsulating some kind of uh, primitive type so we can avoid this primitive obsession there. For example, I have my amount value object encapsulating just value of my possible maybe transfer amount with some simple evaluation place, what is the minimal amount or ma the maximal amount. So I have these value objects that are in here. I have my definition of the repositories acting as a contract stating what I can and what I cannot do with my specific aggregate. So if I cannot delete a wallet, it means I cannot delete it. If my repository as an interface from my core domain layer perspective doesn't allow me to delete something, I cannot delete it, right? This is my contract stating what I can do with this specific aggregate. So we have our kind of uh, simple hybrid of domain-driven design approach and some basic building blocks. We have our clean architecture in place so that our core layer is actually not referencing any other layers. The application layer is just referencing our you know, um, core layer. So internally, it can declare, for example, some kind of common handlers for, for example, uh, transferring the funds or adding the funds to the wallets and so on. Finally, we have the infrastructure layer where once again, we would declare, for example, our data access um, layer, our DB context, our default schema, maybe some temporary storage in memory, maybe some additional stuff, maybe some additional caching. So this is going to be our wallets module, right? As you can see, yet another module with yet another architectural style and all within a single monolith approach within a single monolithic architecture, which is now being split vertically, right? Not and no longer horizontally. And finally, we have our shared layer. So within the shared layer, we are going to keep all of this cross-cutting and infrastructural concerns. So for example, the definition of my I command or I command handler or I command dispatcher, the same for the queries or maybe the definition of my iMessage broker. So if I want to publish message somewhere, I will then inject this simple interface, this abstraction into, let's say, specific um, application service or command handler within a specific module. And I'm going to use this abstraction from any other module. I'm not going to repeat myself by declaring the same 
message broker interface in the same module, since this is going to be shared across all the modules anyway, when we talk about event-driven architecture and event-driven approach. So this is where I will put all of my cross-cutting concerns and shared abstractions. For example, if I want to have some initializer from my database, well, I will just, for example, scan from my da database context, context and I will call their migrations internally and I will migrate my database for the first time. If I want to have some simple abstraction on top of my daytime, maybe I'll just declare some kind of iClock interface with the default UTC clock implementation. And I'm just going to use this abstraction within my modules, right? This is cross-cutting concern that are being shared. This is not related to the specific application or business logic in a specific module at all. And if I were to move into the microservices, if I were to transition my modules into microservices, I would probably publish this as I already mentioned, for example, some kind of NuGet package and then reference it from the different microservices to reuse the same, to reuse the same infrastructural utilities helpers. And one more thing, within our modules, you can find this shared project. And as I have already mentioned, there are like multiple ways how you can start talking between the modules. So whether this is going to be synchronous calls, one module asking another module about, for example, data, or asking the module to perform some action, you can achieve it either by adding all these, let's say, module clients abstractions into your shirt, but I'm not a big fan of this. You can either do what we have here, which is adding this shared projects into our specific module. So for example, you can find that within our notifications, I have the shared project and I have my notifications mo module public API. So this is what I meant when I described that it's very important to encapsulate the module data. It's all application business logic within the module. So it should never leave, let's say the boundaries of the module. But instead, if we want one module to talk to another module, we must expose some kind of public API. So if I want to send an email, for example, from the user's module perspective or from the wallet's module perspective, I can inject this, I can reference the shared package. So this is why it's called shared in the first place. I can inject then this specific interface into my application logic or into any other place within my module, and then I can call it. And of course, uh, since this is running in memory, there is like no network communication. For example, internally, this is going to use IOC container, and this is going to use some specific component of this notifications module to, for example, send an email, right? And you can find this kind of shared packages for all the modules that actually expose either some kind of public API, let's say for users, I will expose two methods to get user by ID or get user by email. And for wallets, let's see, I have one method there, I can get my wallet by identifier. But you can also see here that, for example, from my users or wallet module perspective, I am also exposing some kind of data transfer objects. So let's say user DTO or wallet DTO. And as we'll discuss later, I can also expose here some kind of contracts for messaging. So whether this is going to be events or comments or queries, I could expose this stuff here within my modules in the shared packages. And for example, if my wallet module wants to use this user's module API, and for example, wants to get this user uh, data by unique user email, it can reference this shared package from my user's module, inject this, and then just call this method. And once again, this will call some implementation which lives within the user module, and for example, grab the user from database but all the communication must be performed through this public API. If it's not defined in the API of the specific module, we cannot do it from the other module's perspective. And one last part, which is our bootstrapper. So this is how we are going to start our modular monolith, right? So all the apps, sorry, all the modules, they are declared as class libraries. So just uh, class libraries, right? And our bootstrapper is the only executable web app within the whole solution. So as you can see, it references our modules APIs. And then within, for example, our startup, our bootstrapper class, we could call the modules, for example, to register themselves. And you can apply different techniques there. You could, for example, build some kind of um, 
reflection utility that would scan your whole assembly and through reflection it would register these modules automatically out of the box or you can be more explicit as we are here where within each module we just simply expose a method like add this module, add notifications module, add users module, add wallets module and so on and within this extension methods I am just regist registering my internal components, my internal layers. So each module is responsible for registering its internal stuff. And again, we can do it even better. For example, we could maybe make use of Autofac IOC container, which actually has this module definition declared within the library itself. And we could use this composition roots approach from the Autofac so that we could have actually distinct instances of IOC container across different modules. But again, it actually depends on the library that you're using. Here, we just wanted to keep things simple. So I'm just using the default IOC iService collection from our .NET Core framework. And the same, for example, for the middleware. If I want to have some kind of additional middleware declared per module or some HP interceptors or some additional behaviors, I could just follow this convention and expose additional methods for use module, this, then, and that, and then maybe put there some additional middleware uh, that will be called within the scope of the specific module. And of course, finally, I want to call some kind of shared framework here. So I want to, for example, register the error handling, some middleware for error handling, or the comments handling, the query handlers, some kind of messaging, some kind of database implementation, all that stuff. So I'm just going to, for example, from our shared layered uh, uh, perspective, I'm going to expose here some kind of extension method, which will register all this modular monolith framework, right? So we can use this different abstractions, this different cross-cutting concerns implementations across the different modules. And this is how our sample modular monolith can be glued all together. So now that we can see how it's all being built and how we can, for example, communicate between our modules through this shared projects, let's try to see the first use case and let's see how we can start with the synchronous communication approach and then how we can proceed further to the more event-driven approach. All right, let's start with our very first simple use case. So we'll move on to our users module into our users controller. And here you will find this HTTP post method called create user. And this is going to accept some kind of user detail DTO. It will generate its identifier in the most simple way that you can think of by calling GUID in GUID. And then this is going to just call our user service being directly injected as this so called kind of application service into our controller. We are going to call this method and then we are just going to return some, for example, 201 created action um, HTTP response code uh, along with some endpoint pointing to this newly created resource. So let me put a breakpoint here and let's try to invoke this specific endpoint and let's see what happens. So I'm just going to run this in debug mode and then I will jump into the REST uh, client. So within my VS code, what I did, I have installed this very nice um, extension called REST client. I've been using this for a very long time now, but of course you can use Postman or any other HTTP client that you are familiar with. So if you want to use VS code and this extension, I encourage you to do so. This is a very cool extension. And you will find this npay.rest file here the root directory, which you can use along with this extension. So you can declare the variables starting with add. You can declare, of course, your request starting with this three pounds. And then if I just do get URL and my app is up running, I'll get back my hello world from the local host. But if I go to my modules and within each module, which of course has contains this public API exposed for the controllers or just routing in general, you can see I have some kind of wallet rest file and also these users rest file here so i can talk with my for example users or wallets module controllers the public api in general so here within my users rest file what i'm going to do is i'm going to call this uh, url called post and i'm going to make a new user with some 
default data, all right? Just some random data here. So let me hit the post method. I am hitting now my debugger. So if I go into the, let's say, implementation of this method, you can see here that I'm just doing some very simple validation there, uh, verifying that email is unique. But of course, I have this email additional, additionally declared on my database as unique index. So it's not just uh, the application layer validation, of course. Uh, just a bunch of very simple, less or more complex validation, uh, some if statements here and there, just a typical CRUD stuff, right? So I'm just calling through this uh, lines of code and just, you know, calling my database, saving changes, logging the stuff, and there is my response back. So there's my user. And of course I can now call this endpoint, for example, and this should hit once again, my user's controller, as you can see here, and this will make use of this get method. So if I put a breakpoint here, and here you will see that refreshing this will hit this breakpoint. It will call the database once again and give me my user properly mapped into our DTO object. All right, so very typical stuff. Now let's jump into our wallets module. All right, so from the wallets module perspective in our core layer, we have this simple aggregate called an owner. The owner is someone who can own the wallet, right? And it can use this wallet for the payments. So with the business, we decided that this is part of a separate module. This is, you know, additional different, you know, scope, additional boundary and so on and so on. So we just want to use the subset of maybe properties coming from the original user entity, the simple entity there. And maybe you want to enrich this user with some additional data related to managing or dealing with the wallets. So we want to have some additional flags there or maybe some pro more properties here. So this is this is going to be called an owner, all right? So from our wallets module perspective, what I want to achieve now is that I want to create an owner. So the user has been registered, so I can see in the database that here at the users table, there is a new user added to our table, all right? But from the wallets perspective, right, if I am somehow, if I have some kind of, let's say, relation between my wallet and an owner, I can't really you know, own any wallet and I can do any transfer between the wallets since there is no owners yet. There are no owners. So I want to make this owner. So I can see that within my, within our owners controller, there is this single post method called add owner. So once again, here we decided to go with this clean architecture approach. We also decided to go, go with the CQRS. So we'll have comments and queries and all the stuff that also that direct very deeply, very in depth described in his own mini uh, CQRS screen architecture course. So here, let's take a look. I have this add owner method, and let's see what happens if I put a breakpoint here. So I'm going now to jump into the public API of the wallets module. This wallets rest file, let me open it here. And there is this method post owners, where I can specify the email, and of course, it has to be the email of the valid user. So I'm going to make this post call, and of course, I'm hitting my breakpoint there, there is my email properly bound to this command. And now I'm hitting my owner handler, add owner handler, all right? So what is happening here, let's take a look. I am now calling synchronously my users module API. So this is the API coming from this shared project of my users module, and I am going to call this method get user async by email. So here, of course, I am working on top of the abstraction, right? The modules in terms of public API between each other, that they share between each other, they are only going to expose some interfaces, right? So I'm going to operate on this interface, right? And then when I call this, of course, internally, this is going to call, for example, the users module, internal user service, which from the wallets module is not visible since the wallets module only works on top of the abstraction provided by this shared project from the users module. This is going to return the user DTO. So once again, I never want to expose the entities from the module. I never want to expose the domain. I always want to expose the DTO objects, some kind of read models. And then I just move on with my overall logic. I you know pull this user data based on this DTO coming from the user's module. I create my owner with some data coming from the user. Maybe I'll put there more, more data that I need on my own and I save it into my database. And that's okay 
But there is one thing that we could probably refactor because you can imagine that whenever we, for example, make a user, make a user within our app, and maybe later on we'll decide that the user might have a specific role. As you can see, I don't care about authentication, authorization stuff, because it's not part of the modular, it's not part of this course, right? This is just some generic cross-cutting concern that you could apply rather easily to any project, right? So I don't care really about users in terms of authentication here. I care about the business value of the user as someone who can use our system, who can later on, for example, register, provide its own personal data, be verified by employee of our company and start sending the money to their to to these user wallets to his own or her own wallet so this is our user concept but the business might tell you so pretty much whenever the user is created we want to have this owner wallet in place somehow automatically, there is no need to user, there is no need from, let's say, user perspective to additionally call this post endpoint or from, let's say, mobile app perspective or web app perspective to additionally call this post endpoint, right? Somehow this owner should be automatically created whenever the user is registered or let's say whenever the user gets verified later on. So now let's see how we could transition this synchronous communication approach to the asynchronous approach and how we could start reducing this uh, coupling between the modules, right? Which is the implementation of this, uh, implication of this synchronous communication by making use of this event-driven approach. We have just implemented the synchronous communication between two models. So we have our wallet module calling the users module in order to get the user data, right? So it can fulfill or it can create its owner, where the owner is what we mean by someone who can own a wallet, whether this is, for example, a regular customer, or maybe later on, we could even think of having individual owners or maybe some kind of company owners or corporate owners with set of different rules or properties this is what we mean by an owner. So again, it might seem like a user, but from a different module perspective, it might contain some subset of the original user data or some maybe additional properties, right? So we might take only a few user properties and then extend it with some additional properties related to the owner. Maybe the owner will have to be additionally verified Maybe the corporate owner later on in the future will have to require some additional tax ID or you know, a company details and so on. So this is why we really want to replicate this data so that these modules can be, can be independent from each other and you know, they can rely on their own data set, which is adjusted to their needs. But the question remains, do we really have to call our module synchronously. Because later on, if we, for example, transition into the microservices, what we'd have to do to achieve the same behavior is to, of course, for example, refactor our underlying module to module in memory in process communication, which for now is, as you can see, being done just by injecting our interface, which is, of course, properly resolved for the IOC container and then we're just calling a method in memory, so it's all fine. But then, for example, in the microservices world, we would have to maybe make an HTTP request for the network layer. And then what if the user's module and now the microservice is down? We need to apply some retry policies, right? So we would start having this kind of tight coupling, this dependency between one service and another. And we couldn't really, you know, be fully and autonomous and like fully operate regardless of this user's microservice being online or offline, because for this specific action, we would still have to call this microservice every time. So in some cases, whenever it's possible, we might think of reducing this coupling, which means reducing this synchronous communication and whether this is going to be within modular monolith scope, which is module talking to another module, 
through some synchronous method calls or later on in a microservices scope, which is one service talking to another through some transportation, synchronous tra transportation uh, pattern, communication layer, HTTP, gRPC, WebSockets, or anything else. So what we can do instead is to make use of this event-driven approach. And event-driven is great for reducing this coupling because right now the whole coupling will be moved into this additional piece of infrastructure called the message broker. And again, depending on the message broker that you are going to use, it's, you know, internal namings might differ or the way it works, the way it behaves might differ. So whether you are going to use, for example, RabbitMQ or NAS, or whether you are going maybe to use Kafka for the event streaming, or maybe additionally for some kind of hybrid event sourcing purposes, or whether we are going to use Azure Service Bus or Amazon Queues, it doesn't matter that much. Of course, it matters from, let's say, technical perspective. How do you connect to this broker? How do you you know, work with partitions and topics in Kafka? Or how, how do you work in, with the queues in RabbitMQ and so on? But from the generic, um, let's say, concept of event-driven architecture, it looks pretty much similar uh, depending, regardless of the broker that you will, or the service bus that you will start using. And in our case, we are not even going to use this additional message broker, because of course you could use, for example, RabbitMQ as a message broker for your modular monolith, but especially in some cases, especially at the beginning, it might be a bit of an overkill, right? Because when you plug in some additional piece of infrastructure, so at first you have to remember that you need to take care of it. Ideally, you want to run this in some cluster high availability mode because if you rely heavily on a message broker, just like you rely on a database being always up and running, if the database goes down or if the message broker goes down, well, your application can't really do much stuff. So you need to take care of it. And on top of it, you have the network layer. So you need to take care of things like retrying, um, message acknowledgement, um, some maybe dead letter queues, uh, ignoring duplicates. So pretty much all the stuff related to so-called guaranteed delivery or exactly once processing, which are kind of specific challenges when it comes to dealing with the message brokers. I mean, the, the real message brokers running as a separate piece of infrastructure. So what we are going to do is that we are going to kind of simulate the message broker, but we are going to use a very simple in-memory broker. And later on, if you want, of course, you can switch the real message broker, especially if you will, you know, transition into microservices at some point in the future. This is where you'll need to plug in the real, real message broker because now once you will start having, for example, two or three standalone applications and they will start talking to each other through HTTP or they will start sending messages between each other through this message broker, for example, using the AMQP protocol, well, you need to have this real message broker in place because you won't be able to, you know, maybe <laughs> except using some uh, inter-process uh, communication and techniques or libraries, you won't be really able to talk to the service living on another server in memory, right? So yeah, then certainly you will have to use a dedicated message broker. But in our case, we are going to use in-memory broker. So the core idea is that we'll remove this direct coupling between the services. We will no longer call one service from another service perspective, but instead we are just going to publish the messages and the other modules and later on other microservices can subscribe and react to these messages. So for example, from our wallet module perspective, what we can do is instead of every time when we want to create an owner, you know, we no longer want to call synchronously our get user by ID or, or get user by email method coming from the users module, but instead we'll want to subscribe to some kind of, let's say, user created or user verified event coming from the users module. And based on this event, for example, we want to automatically create an owner. And once you start thinking 
more about this event-driven approach, especially if, once again, let me rephrase it, uh, we assume that we have you know, uh, found out the proper boundaries of our modules, right? So, for example, we run the event storming session and we talk with product owners, you know, domain experts, business people in general about these processes and about this as well big picture and, you know, a little bit more in process uh, level or even deeper level within our event storming session. We talked about the boundaries and the events, the hotspots, all this stuff. And especially in the big picture process, when you start with the events definition, you can see that even though some parts of your system that might at a first glance look to be like fully synchronous, they actually might appear to be like a, a synchronous processes, right? The typical sample, e-commerce, right? When you start a delivery, when you make a payment, when you're processing a payment, it's all asynchronous stuff. And the client is aware, the customer is aware that this will take time, that processing delivery will take time, or that processing a payment will take time. So why would the client synchronously wait for this stuff, right? This is like asynchronous by the nature. But for example, in our app, we can also make it fully event driven. So starting with something as simple as, for example, creating an owner whenever the user gets, for example, created or verified, right? And enriching this owner with some additional data. Or for example, let's say, maybe in the future, we would introduce additional module for making deposits, some kind of payments module. And then whenever you make a payment to the actual physical bank account, instead of synchronously calling, hey, wallet module, I just made a payment. So please, synchronously, I'm calling you, add this virtual funds to your wallet because I just made a payment, right? I put this real, you know, let's say physical money into this bank account. So please synchronously add funds to this wallet. Instead, what we could do is, for example, publish an event, payment completed, deposit added. And then based on this event, the wallet would know, all right, someone just uh, made a deposit, right, to this bank account. So I'm just going to, you know, um, add these funds to my wallet. And then I don't care if the payment system is up or not, is up and running, because I am fully autonomous. I no longer rely on this service or module being available or not, or you know being properly implemented or not. I don't care if these modules or microservice will give me an error if I call this method, this public API, because I am no longer going to call it. I am going to listen to the events, and based on these events, I am going to react uh, on my site and process some specific actions, right? Maybe change some data on my site and so on. So now let's get back into the code and let's see how we can refactor our synchronous communication into this asynchronous event-driven integration. All right, let's get back into our add owner command handler and let's see how we can get rid of this, right? So actually, we want to get rid of the whole controller, right? From that point on, let's assume that we no longer want to synchronously call this post action and no longer we want our add owner handler to synchronously call this other modules, all right, method. So we want to reduce this coupling, this temporal coupling and this module to module, point to point kind of dependency and want to uh, transition towards the event-driven architecture. So let's jump back into our users module. And here from our user service perspective, what we would like to do is the following. So once we save our user entity to the database, for example, or later on, once we, for example, verify, verify our user, which let's say is a next step, you can imagine our user being verified by the employee of the company, uh, the user maybe would have to provide its own personal details, the photo, and we would run some kind of KYC, some checks to just make sure this is not maybe a, a fraud or a scammer, or this is actually the user getting, that can legally use our system to start transferring the funds. So we have some simple use case like this defined here down below. So whenever things like that happen, we want to produce some kind of event from this specific module so that other modules could react to this event, 
So here, what, are go what I'm going to use is this iMessage broker coming from our shared project, this simple abstraction, and we'll see how it's working behind the scenes in a moment. So I'm going to inject this interface to our user service, so our application service, which lives within the users module. And when I make a user, I'm going to call this message broker and then publish async, okay? And the publish async will accept an event. So I can declare pretty much, I can make an event anything I want. So since we want other modules to be able to subscribe to our events, I'm going to put this event under this uh, shared events directory. So there is my user created event, just a simple record, which of course behind the scenes is still a reference type, it's still a class, where I would specify the payload of my event. And for example, here is another event, user verified with some additional payload, user ID, email, nationality, or whatever I need, or maybe whatever the other, other modules will need from my payload. So I'm just going to call this publish async, and then I'm going to specify new user created as an instance of my event. So here is my data, user ID, user email, user name, and user nationality. And I'm just going to do the same for our next uh, action, which is going to be called user verified. And let me just, of course, await this. So I'm going to do the same stuff here, but of course, I'm just going to pass the new event, which is called user verified. So let's say, once again, the user ID, user email, user nationality. Now, when it comes to the events naming, keep in mind that once again, once again, the name of your events, some of these events could be discovered, for example, during the event storming sessions, right? Where you will discuss with the business from the events perspective, what is happening within your system as an, as an action. And you could use these business names of the events to actually, actually within your code. Uh, but the general, I would say, principle is that try to avoid this CRUD-related naming, like, let's say, user-created, right? Okay, user-created, registered, that's, I would say, kind of fine. But here, I could do something like user-updated, and maybe then just send a user ID. But what does it mean, user-updated? Updated, what property has been updated? So it's better to say user-verified, or maybe user-locked, where I... By, where by the name of the event, I specified what happened so that the event subscriber, the consumer of this event, doesn't have to, for example, call my module additionally or maybe later on microservice additionally to find out what actually changed. So this is important to name your events so they sound like, like some kind of business implications of the ongoing processes across different modules or different microservices. So I'm going to publish this and this event. And now... Let's take a look from our wallet's module perspective, what is going to change. So here under owners, I have this um, two implementations of our event handler there, and they are commented out now. So I'm just going to uncomment them, one for the user created, and there's another one for the user verified. So let's see the user created event, what is going to happen? So whenever the user's module publish, will publish this event, I am going to, react to this event. And for example, I am going to check if maybe someone published by an accident the same event for any reason. So I could either fail this or make this method more idempotent by just returning. I don't care. Maybe you just publish this by an accident another time with the same user ID. Nothing really uh, changes on my site. But when the new user is created, and let's say when there is no error, this is a valid unique event being published for the new user. What I'm going to do is that I'm just going to make an owner here, right, within this module. So now, no, lo I am no longer going to be dependent on this specific post action declared within my owner's controller, which internally is using synchronous module communication, because now I'm just going to react to the events. You can imagine that, for example, here, Maybe someone would introduce a bug within this method. Maybe this would internally, at some point, throw an exception. And you would never be able, or at least for as long as you know the developer uh, wouldn't fix this error, you wouldn't be able to add an owner to your wallet module because there would be some kind of, let's say, internal error within this scope of this module. 
that is, let's say, not part, not the responsibility. So we want to avoid this possible, uh, this, this dependencies, this coupling, where some kind of error handling might be required, some retry policies, and especially later on, if you think of moving into microservices, you would have to, you know, incorporate some kind of maybe poly, a retry patterns, circuit breakers, a lot of stuff to actually ensure that your services are very resilient in terms of communication, in terms of the synchronous communication. So whenever possible, we should or we would like to avoid this. Of course, as long as our domain, as, as our business gives us the green light to make this process, you know, asynchronous. Um, so let's see what will happen now. If I run this up and let's see if we make another user now. All right. So let me just make another user by calling, let's say, user2. So from the user's module perspective, I'm going to make a new user. And let's hit the action there. And let's get into our at async. And now let's see what happens. I'm going to make this publish async. And what happened is that I have received this event here and I'm just processing this event, right? So now I can see that there is both the user in the user's module, user's table, and there is my owner, which was created automatically as a subscription to this event. So my application logic that previously, you know, used the synchronous communication and I had to manually call this post action. Now I have more a reactive system because I react to the event, right? And I react to the event and I no longer care if this module is available or not, if this method works properly or not. I'm just going to use this event and then I have my local data, my lo so-called local cache for this owner, which I made based on the user data, and I am good to go. I can work on my own, and I don't really need user's module anymore because I have all the data I need based on this event, for example, stored in my database, and I call this entity owner within the context of this module or this microservice later on. And if we take a look at the other modules, for example, if we take a look at our notifications module, you'll notice the same, that we have just a bunch of handlers, for example, wallet added handler, or owner verified handler here, as you can see, this should be named this way. We have our user created handler. Once again, let me uncomment this out. We have our user verified handler or funds added handler and a few other handlers so that whenever, for example, we verify an owner, we create a user, we add funds to our wallet, what is going to happen is that this specific notifications module will subscribe to this event and, for example, will send an email to the specific user. Hey, someone just added funds to your wallet or hey, your account just got verified. You can start using the app, right? So our notifications module, it's not exposing, let's say, any controllers because you can think of it some, you know, kind of background job, background module that will just subscribe to the events and then based on these events, it will, for example, send to you some email messages, text messages, or maybe push notifications. So this is how you can start moving into this event-driven architecture or style and start thinking about parts of your, you know, um, application logic uh, and you can start looking into your dependencies between your modules and see which actions could be refactored from the synchronous module to module. Hey, give me data, right? Calls to this asynchronous. There is a data. There is something that happened on my site. React to this. Consume this if you want to. So you can avoid much better decoupling and you can have your module modules to be like truly autonomous. So there will be like no longer any coupling between them. And just to quickly um, check how it's uh, how this message broker is working here. So as I said, I'm not using any kind of specific, uh, let's say RabbitMQ here, because this would be an overkill for, Seras, for such an application. So if I take a look at the code behind, let's see. Uh, this is a very simple in-memory message broker. That's what I call this. But the only nice, but the nice part about this is that it's not like fully synchronous so that when I make an event, what is happening here, 
I am using this nice concept from the .NET, from the system channel um, API. And here, I am just publishing this asynchronously. And by asynchronous publishing, I'm not, I don't mean just using the async, await, and task keywords, but what I mean here is if we take a look at the details, implementation of this so-called async event dispatcher is that I'm just putting this, I'm adding this uh, event, this message into this uh, channel, right? So once again, this is just a way of how I can decouple, for example, my synchronous call from my synchronous call. How I could, for example, push the message from my controller to some background job, which lives outside of the HTTP context scope, right? So here I'm just pushing this message to this channel by calling this writer write async. And here I have additional uh, background job. So as you can see here, I have this call, so-called even dispatcher job, which is the consumer of this channel, right? This So it's using, reusing the same even channel, but the reader part, uh, and I'm just asynchronously in the background consuming these events. So it works a bit more like a real world message broker where you don't have the synchronous request response style of message publishing, but you have this asynchronous style where you publish a message, it's, you know, and then your module microservice, you know, completes, um, completes its job just by sending messages to the broker and then the other modules or other microservices can asynchronously subscribe to this event. So if any error happens, if any delay happens on the specific module or microservice site, you don't care. As a producer, you publish the message and you don't care if the other services were able to consume this or not. And of course, by you don't care, what I mean is that if you start breaking the contracts of the message, let's say you send an invalid payload, of course, you do care about this because it's your fault. But again, this is something that could be, for example, properly test with some kind of contract testing libraries like Pact, IO, or any other library. Uh, but this is once again outside of the scope of this, let's say, course, outside of the scope of this series. The idea here is that you publish a message and then the other modules or later on microservices subscribe to this message within their own scope and based on these messages, based on these events, they, for example, decide to transfer the funds, to send an email or to do anything else so that your overall system is more reactive and there is much less coupling or there could be even no coupling between the modules in terms of this synchronous communication. At some point, you might want to transition your modular monolith into the microservices. And as I said, starting with modular monolith might be a much better choice, especially when you have this microservices transition in mind, than when starting with the classical monolithic approach. Because uh, trying to extract the microservices from your horizontal horizontally layered monolith with, you know, coupling between different components, trying to extract the pieces of the already existing database and trying to extract, let's say, the tables using by, being used by different components, which, you know, would be part of different layers or different directories within uh, your monolithic app could be a really difficult task. I'm not saying it's impossible, it's like totally possible, but probably not the best developer experience. While with the modular monolith, this is going to be, I would say, a much smoother, much easier transition. And of course, it's not going to be like extremely simple, but if you stick to these rules that we talk about, being the public API, data encapsulation and this separation when it comes to your data so that you are no longer using your database as kind of integration pattern between your module, the overall transition should be much easier than in a classical monolith. So now let's see what pattern we can apply to achieve this. One of the patterns that you could think of applying Whenever you actually work with, for example, legacy code, and maybe you would like to uh, 
um, refactor this legacy component into the new version, or maybe would like to, you know, build a module based on a few components within your currently classical horizontally layered monolithic application, but you would like to start transitioning this monolithic app into modular monolithic application. Or maybe if, like in our case, you would like to transition the specific module into the microservice, what you can make use of is, for example, this pattern called the Strangler Fig. So the core idea is actually very simple. At first, what you are going to do is to provide some kind of facade, right? Some kind of the abstraction so that the consumers of either your current, let's say, legacy component that you are going to refactor to the new component or the current module that you are going to, let's say, transition to microservice, the consumers, the users of this specific component or module, they will talk through this specific abstraction. So from their perspective, nothing is really actually going to change, right? So instead of, for example, calling your module directly, they will call some kind of I module proxy or I module facade that will internally redirect the request into your module. And then in the meantime, you could work, for example, on the new version of this module. And when the time comes, you will just replace the implementation of the old module into the new module. And since the consumers of your module, they talk for this proxy, for this facade, for this abstraction, from their perspective, nothing will change because you will now point your facade, your abstraction to, let's say, um, consume or redirect the traffic to this new module and remove the old module. So this is what we could do with the microservices transition. So imagine that we have our modular monolith API, our public API, and then we would we decided that we want to, for example, move our users or wallets, notifications, payments, whatever module you can think of into the microservice. So what we could do is the following. At first, we would expose some kind of proxy, some kind of facade on top of our public API so that the consumers of our modular monolith backend, they would now hit this proxy first. And it can be, you know, as simple as, for example, setting up the reverse proxy on top of the IS server, Apache, Nginx. You could build your own API gateway. If you are from .NET, you could use, uh, for example, just plain ASP.NET Core. You could use Ocelot, you could use Yarp from Microsoft, or any other project that you can think of. The core idea is that you want your consumers to hit your proxy first, and then your proxy will decide where to redirect this specific traffic. So in our case, we would expose this proxy on top of our backend of our already existing modular monolith, and this proxy would redirect directly uh, the, the traffic, the request directly to our modular monolith, right? So nothing changes there. And once we have established this part, so all the consumers of our modular monolith API talk for this facade, for this proxy, we could start working on this, let's say, new microservice. So let's assume we want to transition this specific user's module into user microservice. So, all right. Let's start working on the microservice. And once we have implemented our microservice, we can now tell our proxy to redirect this specific traffic that would previously hit this modular monolith. And then this specific user's module, for example, the set of controllers, the public API declared by the user's module. So we no longer want to hit our modular monolith, but instead, we want to redirect the traffic to hit, to reach our user's microservice. And from the modular monolith API consumer's perspective, from our system API, public API consumer perspective, nothing really changes. It's a seamless transition. Ideally, the consumers of our system, they shouldn't care if they talk to the modular monolith, monolith, or bunch of microservices or any other kind of architecture that you can think of. They, should they shouldn't they should really care, right? So they just hit some kind of API. And whether this is going to be internally bunch of microservices or not, whether this API is actually an API gateway or Nginx server or anything else, 
it shouldn't matter to the consumers of our system. All these changes should be as seamless, as transparent to them as possible. So you can apply this pattern for transitioning between your modules to microservices or transitioning between your, let's say, components into the actual modules if you are moving from, let's say, this classical horizontally layered um, monolith into this more vertically sliced, vertically split modular monolith approach. This is like a very nice pattern, like stronger freak pattern or branch by abstraction pattern. Just keep in mind that if you are in the middle of modular monolith to microservice transition, you have to take care of your infrastructure. If you still have these dependencies, if you still have modules talking to each other through the public API, which as you have seen during this uh, one of the previous lessons, which is currently injected by our IOC container and resolved through the DI, right, for this container, well, of course, it won't work anymore. So you'd have to refactor this into, for example, HTTP clients, right, to just run this request through the network, because now this is module talking to microservice. There is no longer, let's say, um, wallet's module talking talking to the user's module. This is now wallet's module from modular monolith talking to the micro to the user microservice. And later on, if you extract the wallets into wallet's microservice, you will have wallet's microservice talking to the user's microservice. So communication is one part, and the other parts are of course the events. So if you rely heavily on event-driven approach, on the event-driven architectural style, now that's the high time to plug in the real message broker. And whatever you decide to go on, it's like really up to you. Just do your research, pick the broker, pick the message broker that will be the best fit for your system. Just keep in mind that now, once again, you have to deal with this network challenges. Just keep in mind about this forces of the distributed computing that you can never trust the network, that there are always latencies and that you can never assume that everything will be just fine. You have to be prepared for some kind of outages. You have to be prepared that depending, for example, on the type of the message delivery that your message broker operates, whether this is going to be so-called at most once or at least once delivery, um, you might uh, implement different patterns like inbox, outbox pattern to actually ensure that your never going to um, process the same message multiple times if you receive it duplicates that you are always going to send the message uh, that you are always going to publish an event even if the message broker goes down so there is like a different set of patterns that you can apply once you have the actual microservices once you have the distributed system in place because now there is network and this is how we are going to talk between our services so just to keep this in mind that infrastructure will have to change and the overall burden, you know, overall management of this distributed system now will be much more complex. You have to take into consideration proper monitoring, centralized logging, probably tracing, and later on, of course, orchestration, maybe with Kubernetes, maybe with some other tools. But yeah, you will have to invest heavily into DevOps to be able to run your microservices solution really well uh, without hopefully any outages and be able to react very fast uh, if any outage uh, were to happen within your distributed system. So yeah, this is how, yeah, uh, kind of easily you can start transitioning your modules into microservices. And as long as the boundaries of your modules are right, it should be as seamless transition as just you know copying and pasting your existing module code into the new application and then just exposing it to the outside world and then just making sure that your infrastructure is in place, that you have refactored your module clients to let's say HTTP clients and your in-memory broker into the actual real world message broker. So yeah, hopefully, this will give you a good overview of how you can start transitioning your modules to the microservices. And this is it. We have reached the end of our mini course about the modular monolith. Uh, thank you for being here with me, for staying with me for the time. Hopefully you have learned something new 
Even if you are not a .NET developer, if you are not writing your code in C Sharp, you are still able to go along and to find find out about some new patterns or practices that you could think of applying in your own projects, in your own in your programming languages that are different than .NET and C Sharp, because all that really matters are the principles. The, the language is just a tool, right? And you can apply this modularity, this shared projects, this abstractions, this event-driven, all this stuff into pretty much any programming language that is out there. So once again, thank you for being here with me. And of course, keep in mind that you know systems architecture in general is not an easy topic. It's not something that could be discussed and very well described in a matter of one or two or five or even ten hours. It's like a really complex and huge topic. So once again, uh, I encourage you to check out uh, the course that uh, was made by another dev mentor, Darek, about the CQRS and a clean architecture, a very in-depth course that you can find again uh, find on our YouTube channel. And if you are interested in modular monolith, if you like to know more about modular monolith, if you like to see how it's going to, you know, work on a more realistic application, much bigger application with all its caveats, all its challenges, all the different patterns that we've talked to, but we haven't implemented them in this sample project. Um, in the next few weeks, so hopefully uh, next month, which is going to be December, so December 2021, last year, last month of this year, we are going to publish uh, this full, very comprehensive, I would say about 20 hours long course on our DevMentors.io platform. So if you are interested in this topic, uh, make sure to uh, check this one out. And once again, thank you for being here and see you in the next episodes in which we are going to discuss different topics.